Hello, my name is Alexander Weimann. I'm the artistic director of the Seattle Baroque Orchestra, and I'm greeting you from the attic of my home in Metro Vancouver. While we cannot meet in the concert hall, I would like to take the opportunity to share with you some background information on our profession and invite you to take a look behind the stage. I hope this may help you to learn a little more about music and to grow loving it even more deeply. Today's topic is Temperament and Pitch, Volume 1, The Basics. I owe you somewhat of a nerd alert to the following tutorial, but if you bear with me, you will comprehend with basic physics and math skills how temperament poses a problem to all polyphonic music and has kept generations of musicians busy finding answers. If you play an instrument yourself, you are likely used to tuning it whenever need be. Only pianists are used to the luxury of having technicians come over and take their sorrows away periodically. In particular historical keyboards like a clavichord, a forte piano or a harpsichord need to be tuned so often that we have to do it on our own. Like many colleagues, I'm using tuning apps, much like I rely on GPS-based navigation systems to get from A to B. But even the smartest phone runs out of battery, and sometimes you find yourself stranded in an area without cell phone coverage. So it is still a good idea to know how to read a compass and a map and along these lines how to tune without a digital device. This beautiful harpsichord was built by the English maker Tony Chinnery who lives and works near Florence, Italy. It is the copy of a famous South Italian instrument now in the German National Museum Nuremberg. It is named after its owner, the dynasty Grimaldi, old aristocracy with descendants still alive and governing a European dwarf state, the Principality of Monaco. Italian harpsichords came in outer cases which were highly decorated and like with the Grimaldi instrument, the outer case would be way more expensive than the content it carries. How do we actually tune? The pitch of a string depends, besides the gauge and material, on its tension. We increase the tension by tuning the tuning pegs slightly clockwise. This would raise the pitch and we release tension by turning counterclockwise and lowering the frequency. The act of tuning always requires a reference pitch. If the pitch that we want to alter is close to the reference, in playing both strings, we actually do not hear two different pitches. We hear the arithmetic mean between the two frequencies in some sort of trembling manner, which we call beating. This tremolo occurs at a rate which is precisely the difference between the two frequencies. As we approach the reference pitch, the beats become slower and slower and ultimately vanish once the two strings are in tune. Interestingly, that happens regardless of whether the two pitches are in unison or in consonant intervals, like the octave, fifth, third, and so on. With this in mind, Looking at a four and a half octave compass, let us start with one octave. Tune only pure intervals and see how far we get. Starting with the C, first we tune the octave, followed by the fifth. Obviously we need a major third, 
and have already gathered a C major chord to start with. We find the fifth and third over the G the same way. I'm transposing a bit and tune a fourth instead of a fifth to stay within the octave. Now we have G major as well. F and A can be found the same way. That adds an F major chord. And shall we see about the minor chords as well? A minor, E minor, and D minor. Clearly the D A is out of tune. Weird? As we shall see later, no. But for the moment, this method will not help us any further, in particular as we have not even yet touched the upper keys. A more promising idea may be that the 12 notes in our octave are organized in a circle of fifths. So tuning only pure fifths from our starting point may solve our issues. Again, every other fifth I will tune as a pure fourth to keep everything within one octave range. Our arrival should then be one octave higher than our departure. Here we hear the result. You will agree on calling this octave unacceptable. We have to tune the upper note down considerably to reach the pure octave. Would we, by the way, have checked earlier in the process, we would have caught that already the first four fifths result in an E that is too high to serve as a consonant major third to our original C. Also this string we would have to tune down quite a bit to achieve the pure major third. Now, is this not even weirder? No, not really. We need to take a step back and look at the physical structure of sound. Sounds come vastly different in nature. Some are short, rather noisy, and have no real pitch. Others have a clear frequency, a color, and a certain duration. However, all sounds are suitable for music. An exceptionally good example for a piece that requires only percussives is Clapping Music by the American composer Steve Reich, published in 1972. It can be done with two players only and provides as much fun as challenges. In acoustics, the physics of sound we use mainly two sets of criteria to describe the phenomenon. The envelope tells us how the sound changes over time. We look at the attack, decay, sustain and release. Here examples of A the piano, B the trumpet, C a violin and D a flute. The pitch and the color or timbre of a sound is depending on its individual harmonic series. When we hear a pitch, we are normally focused on its fundamental frequency. But this fundamental frequency is only one in a bundle of pitches we hear at the same time. In our example, when we hear a low C, we hear all of the notes you see here, and many more. This series goes on forever. The first in the series is the fundamental and all subsequent harmonics are its overtones with their frequencies at integer multiples of the fundamental or carrier pitch. I will show you a simple physical experiment on this Heinzmann and Sons piano from the early 1900s. Slowly I press the keys of the first nine overtones of the low C so I don't make a sound, but just release the dampers of the strings. With the help of the middle pedal, I can even add a few more notes with my right hand. And hitting the low C will make all the sympathetic strings resonate 
because the C's overtones stimulate them. Trying it with the adjacent loads, B or C sharp, produces a different outcome. For the color, or what we call timbre of a sound, two things are equally important. The envelope and the spectrum of harmonics and their amplitude. Music is really just a vibration of air. And we measure this vibration by counting full wave cycles per second. Since the German physicist Heinrich Rudolf Hertz, the unit is Hertz. So 440 vibrations per second equals 440 Hertz. You see here the sound spectrogram of three instruments all playing an A at 440 Hertz. I find interesting that in none of the three examples the fundamental is the loudest of the harmonics. In the case of the violin, the fifth harmonic is especially prominent. The particular composition of overtones also defines the form of sound wave. Only a tuning fork has a pure sinus wave. All other waves are somehow distorted by the impact of their overtones, so they will sound and look different, however at the same fundamental pitch and with the same wavelength. With a closer look at the series of harmonics, we will find out that we can learn a lot from it. For now, we will focus on four observations. Firstly, the distance from one note to the next becomes increasingly smaller. The gap in between, in music we call it interval, decreases. Octave, fifth, fourth, major third, minor third, even minor third leading to a strange node that is too low to fit our notation system. And from there one and one a lot smaller smaller intervals with technical names that you can find here. As we go on, the increments become small, microtonal and beyond. The second piece of information we receive comes from the order number of each harmonics in the series. If we know the frequency of one of them, we know it for all of them, as they are connected to one another by being integer multiples of the fundamental. If the fundamental, like in our example, has a frequency of 65 hertz, the first overtone would vibrate at 65 times 2 equals 130 hertz, the third at 65 times 3 equals 195 hertz, and so forth. We will take another big step in understanding the ramifications when we look at pairs of harmonics, for a start, neighboring ones, and early in the spectrum. The half dozen primary intervals presented are the octave, the fifth, the fourth, and the major and minor thirds. All of these we perceive as consonances, and their frequency proportions are simple mathematical fractions. 2 over 1, 3 over 2, 4 over 3, 5 over 4, etc. Lastly, and this is really pretty, we see what happens mathematically if we add musical intervals. The fifth, 3 over 2, plus the fourth, 4 over 3, add up to an octave. If we multiply 3 over 2 by 4 over 3, we get 12 over 6, which equals 2 over 1, once we shorten the fraction by 6 over 6. The major third, 5 over 4, plus the minor third, 6 over 5, come out to a fifth, 3 over 2, or 30 over 20. Adding intervals means multiplying their frequency fractions. Those two functions are mutually logarithmic or exponential. And I'm not sure why but I find this truly fascinating. Shall we apply what we just learned to our earlier situation when we were stranded to try tuning the harpsichord? Adding 12 fifths 
means multiplying 3 over 2 by itself for 12 times or taking it to the 12th power. Then we end up with a node that's extremely high and for comparison needs to be transposed 7 octaves down. That means multiplying it with 1 over 2 to the power of 7. That results in 531,441 over 524,288, or as an irrational number, 1.01364326477058, and so on. You see, it's a number slightly higher than 1, so the pitch we come out with is sharper than our departure pitch. This gap was discovered a long time ago. We attribute it to the ancient Greek universal scholar Pythagoras, and therefore call it the Pythagorean comma. We should not be too surprised about this comma. In a way, I lied to you when we added up fifth earlier. We end up with a B-sharp, which by nature is a different note than C-natural. The comma comes up as an issue only because we want what is a spiral to become a circle. We are interested in the identity of B-sharp and C-natural and like them to be interchangeable. We call them enharmonic equivalents. Thus, we need to compress and clinch the spiral and make it fit into a circle. We need to take the comma off somewhere and get to a perfect octave. That does not sound too complicated. Would this solve our problems? No, sadly not. Not only do fifths and octaves not work together, the same is the case for fifths and thirds. We call them all incommensurable. Remember that the major third resulting from the addition of four fifths and taken two octaves down is not the same as the pure major third as found in the harmonic series. Or again, in mathematical terms, 3 over 2 to the 4th power multiplied by 1 over 2 to the power of 2 equals 81 over 64. The pure major third is expressed as 5 over 4, and if we widen the fraction by 16 over 16, which is like multiplying it by 1, we get a term easier to compare, 80 over 64. So the tiny difference between the two e's is 81 over 80 which we can also display as a rational number, 1.0125. It is called the syntonic comma. Even though it is a bit smaller than the Pythagorean comma, it is trifold troublesome because it applies to a group of four-fifths only instead of the total of twelve. It is this incommensurability of our most essential consonances, octave, fifth and third, that makes us understand that we are facing a real dilemma, which by its definition is a situation where one has to make a difficult choice between two or more alternatives that are all equally undesirable. Any answer to this dilemma is a temperament. And the answer of the modern piano is what we call the equal temperament. We will get to this the next time and will also touch the topic of pitch and its variety at different places and different times. For today, I would like to leave you with an anecdote from my years as an accompanist. One of my favorite vocal groups to work with has been the Gesualdo Consort Amsterdam. For a recording of highly chromatic madrigals by Scipione La Corcia, they asked me to play on a so-called cembalo universale, which allows for pure intonation regardless of how remote a key the music goes to. The cembalo universale gives an answer to our dilemma that is not confined to 12 notes per octave. 
we see the usual seven lower keys, but then split upper keys for C sharp and D flat, E flat and D sharp, F sharp and G flat, G sharp and A flat, B flat and A sharp. So we have two instead of one set of upper keys, plus two rudimentary keys between E and F and B and C for either F flat or E sharp and C flat or B sharp. That sums up to 19 instead of 12 keys per octave and trust me, at the end of the week of rehearsing, performing and recording, I felt as much as a beginner on my instrument as on day one. I am looking forward to hearing from you. Let us at Early Music Seattle know what you think, which topics you are interested in, or any ideas you would like sharing. Thank you for listening and watching.